Ken loves a good story. Ha, most of us do. I love that Netflix always has a synopsis of the movie just before you start. So that way you know exactly what you're getting in for. I get into a movie and within two minutes I'm like, you and you are going to fall in love. And I love such stories because they are predictable. When I watch movies like that, I feel safe. I like to know what's about to happen. But sometimes, just like real life, the movie takes you in a different direction and you're surprised at how it's turning out. Although I was born in Scotland, I was lucky to have been raised in Nigeria by wonderful parents. Our parents never stopped affirming their children. They told my brothers and I how amazing we were. They never stopped telling us how smart we were and we were going to be whatever we wanted to be. I spent much of my childhood poring through my father's medical books and looking at skin diseases and pictures of abscesses and the human body cross-section. And I knew, we all knew, that I was going to be a doctor. You could say the story of my life had been written and it was a good one. My name actually tells the story of my life. Tox is short for Olato Kumbo, which means brought back from over the sea. When I was 17, I crossed back to the United Kingdom to do my A-levels. And since I was so smart, I didn't study. And to my utter shock, I failed. I didn't get into medical school, but I went on to do pharmacology with the intention of switching over to medicine at some point. In my second year, I fell in love with my best friend and we got married. And then I became increasingly obsessed with doing up our apartment. I began to spend more and more time at home base and B&Q, and less and less time in human anatomy and physiology lectures. And then one day I said to myself, you know what, we've dropped out. So I got a job as a medical rep with a pharmaceutical company that paid very well. And I loved about 90% of the job and the other 10% was really just the salary. <laughs> and then our babies began to arrive. We had our first three sons, one after the other. And uh, when our third son was born, I requested more suitable hours from my employers as a mom to young children and they turned me down. But I so happened at that time to be reading a book where the author said, your gift is that thing you do so effortlessly that everyone thinks it's a big deal except you. And for me it was interior design. Everyone loved my home, my friends recruited me to design their apartments for them and I thought, yes, that must be my gift. So I enrolled in a couple of design courses and I set up a, an interior design firm and I had only been running it for about, I think about eight months to a year when my husband comes back from work one day and says, let's move to the United States. And I said, yes, let's go. So we sold our home and packed our three little boys and off we went to the beautiful city of Atlanta, Georgia. Life was perfect. The boys embraced their new lives. The business we purchased as part of our move, which was a luxury baby and children's furniture store, was thriving. That was my introduction to the world of high-end furniture for babies and children. And we embraced that whole all-American dream where we're always happy, we were happy. And then we began to hear rumors of a coming recession. Initially, it started confirming itself with the fall in foot traffic. Sales on Saturdays began to drop. And then the stores around us began to shutter. And it was like a domino effect. We were watching it come to hit us. And my husband and I stared at each other as we watched everything we ever owned get swept away by the recession. We wondered what we would tell our friends. We knew we had to come back to England, and we came back broken, confused, and ashamed. When we arrived, I called my friend Susie and said, listen, the party's over, 
and we're coming back home. And she said, come straight to my house from the airport. And when we arrived at Susie's house, there was a breakfast spread, a scrumptious spread waiting for us. And she had converted her dining room into a large bedroom for us. Oh, and I arrived pregnant with my fourth son. <laughs> We stayed with Susie for a few months and I remember my days would start off in tears and they will end in tears. And the rest of the time was spent looking at each other, waiting for our fortunes to be magically reversed. And so, sometimes we would get relief in the form of friends coming to visit us like the Adewales and the Oyobayas and Titi, they would visit and encourage us and tell us that it's okay, we would be fine. Or like the time I went for my 20 week pregnancy scan and the doctor said his fears of our baby being born with a genetic disorder was now dispelled. Or when my mother-in-law said, people lose everything all the time and start from scratch. You wouldn't be the first, you can do it again. Eventually, we faced up to the fact that our story had gathered K-Leg. Translation, our dreams were shattered. Now it's one thing when your dream breaks or something breaks, but when the pieces pick themselves up and smash themselves into smithereens, it's a whole nother story. Yet there is something incredibly empowering when you accept that the synopsis to the movie you've been watching does not accurately tell you exactly where the story is going to go. I began to research the UK market, baby furniture, interiors, children's furniture, and I found that there was absolutely nothing like what we sold in the United States. Everything here seemed very samey, mass-produced, white, boring. So I headed to the European continent and met with some craftsmen who were incredibly skilled in their work, but not known outside of their locality. And I said, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm bringing you to the United Kingdom. And they went, yes! But I had nowhere to sell their products. I didn't have a website. I had previously hired a gentleman to build a website for us. We wanted a state-of-the-art e-commerce website. And he built the most stunning website. It was absolutely beautiful. The branding was on point but the website didn't work. <laughs> so I picked up the phone and I called my friend Esau in Nigeria and I said, hey Esau, I'm really desperate. I need a website built um, and I'm on a very low budget. Esau passes me on to his friend Jonah and here's how the conversation with Jonah went. Hey Jonah, name's Tox. I'm Esau's really good friend and he said, you could help me. And Jonah goes, Esau's friend is my friend, what's your budget? <laughs> and I said, you tell me what you'll charge me, because I couldn't tell him I had 10 pounds, right? <laughs> and Jonah named his price, which I couldn't afford. But I had a thought. I thought about Esau and Jonah who built beautiful websites. I thought about Peter who built a website that did not work. And I thought of all the web designers around the world and realized that they all had one thing in common, they were not born with the ability to build a website. They had to learn, and so could I. So I went on to Google and I typed in how to build a website really quickly. And that was when website building was rocket science, not what it is today. And the website was up and running in 26 days. Next, I ran into a woman who told me that, well, you don't just build a website, you need to have it rank on Google with this thing called SEO. She introduced me to Mike Bradley. Mike was friendly, cheerful, laid back, and spotted an Aussie accent. And Mike named his fee and I couldn't afford it. But he offered to teach me how to do it myself at the fraction of a cost. And I learned how to do it and the website began to rank on Google and we began to get sales and we had the beautiful website with products on it and people were buying and even the press started to take notice of us. But there was a problem. I was ashamed of my story. 
I didn't like how it all came together. I preferred stories that said, I have a business idea, I'm going to put it together, and bam, it's come together. I preferred stories that had the word investor in it, because then it would prove that the idea itself was valid, and the person who had the idea was worthy. I wanted a normal story. But that all changed when I picked up Success Magazine one day, and in it, a story was told of a woman. Two versions of her story were told. The first one described how she went to an Ivy League university and went on to work for two very prestigious firms over a period of time, and then she launched her business and her book was going to be out the following spring. The second story told of how this woman went to university just about scraped through uh, uh, with a third class and uh, did some low paying jobs in a number of firms, prestigious firms no doubt, but they were low paying, and um, was now homeless and hoped to run a business one day and one day write a book. And the story was of the same woman covering the same time period. The writer called the first story the rock star version. And she named the second story the sob version because it made you cry. And I realized in that moment that I had only been telling myself and telling other people one version of my story, and that was the sob version. I grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and I rewrote my story in its rock star version, and I added the sob version to it. And what I ended up with was an authentic story of my life, which was a mixture of good and evil. When I was done writing, I picked up that piece of paper and I read it. I was elated. And I said, whoever this woman is in this paper, I want to be her. <laughs> From that moment on, whenever I felt discouraged, I'll pick it up and I'll read it to remind myself that that's who I really was. And without meaning to, I memorized it. Now one day, I came across an invitation to a charity event and I responded to it. It turned out that the organizer of the event was also a journalist for a national newspaper. And when she saw my website, she said, uh, I'd love to feature some of your products. And I said, sure, let's meet. And we had a meeting. And we, at the meeting, we talk about wallpaper and cots and lighting and rugs and all the usual stuff. And as she gets up to leave and puts her coat on, and she's buttoning up her coat, she goes, how did you even get into this? and my rock star story comes out of my mouth. And she sat back down and grabbed her phone and said, I've got to make a call. She called her editor and said, we've got a good story and we must run it. And they went on to feature my story in their newspaper. And this was a story I was so ashamed of. Someone must have read the story and nominated me for an award. At the award ceremony, everyone wanted to know how I got into the niche of selling luxury baby furniture. And my rock star, authentic story kept telling itself around the room. That evening, I received a number of invitations to speak at private events, as well as an invitation to join a charity, Urban Synergy Mentors, <coughs> young children in the inner city schools, and I'm still a part of it today. The story I was so ashamed of became my calling card. It led to an invitation by the Prime Minister to have cocktails at 10 Downing Street. It led to my business opening its concession in a major department store. And it even had this face on billboards all over the United Kingdom and beyond in a major advertising campaign for a major company. Your rock star story is the story of your life with its twists and turns. If you don't write your story, someone will write it for you and you will leave by their narrative. Write your story. <laughs>